Right, good morning. Back with me in my living room um, for episode three of Stopping with Sean. Um, we've got an excellent programme coming up. Um, and just to report back, there are still no Swifts in North London. Where are you, Swifts? I'm actually starting to worry now. If you see any, please, please let me know. Um, this week, we've um, seen real exposés of the government's poor decision making um, and poor planning for the risks of uh, a, pl a pandemic. The lack of uh, action in terms of putting together uh, the ventilator plan, for example, really worth reading uh, the Financial Times on that as well as the big timeline that's been in uh, the Sunday Times as well. It's all incredibly shocking um, and we've also seen that that not until after a very long delay after they'd given up on containment and not yet moved into lockdown did we actually see the scientific advice that the government had had and scientists have been saying this week now um, how much their advice had been ignored and yet none of us not the opposition parties um, not the general public were able to see that scientific advice and this is definitely worrying in terms of making decisions in a crisis situation um, because things like freedom of information don't cover this um, government advice in terms of making decisions while those decisions are being made is is exempt there's basically a big hole in the powers that the information commissioner has uh, center for public scrutiny have been looking at this and looking at ways in which we can fill the gaps to make uh, things more collaborative, um, get scrutiny going again in councils and in places like the GLA that are very, very uh, hard pressed at the moment because we cannot do without scrutiny. Without scrutiny, we know that's how bad decisions get made. We've seen some really serious examples of it. And the Centre for Public Scrutiny also say we can't just be putting off um, doing the decisions, working out how to do this for a few months, assuming things will get back to normal. We've seen the, um, the lockdown extended. We can't assume we're going to be able to do what we did before within a few months. So we have to find new ways of doing this and new ways of working with opposition politicians, being more open with the public about the advice you're getting and the decisions you're making. So that's my lesson for the week. Coming up um, on the programme uh, later on today, uh, we're looking at some of the risks faced by people um, who are already in vulnerable groups facing risks and how those might be getting worse during the crisis. I'll be talking to Benali Hamdash, who is the co-chair of the LGBTIQA plus Greens and a City Hall Assembly candidate for the May election, which is next year now. So I won't be seeing him as a colleague um, in the near future, but hopefully next year. Um, we'll be talking about the particular vulnerabilities uh, faced by the LGBTIQA plus community, um, three out of 10 of which have, had already been experiencing problems at home before the lockdown occurred. And I'll also be looking at the problem of finding a free toilet when you're traveling in London. This is something we were working on in the assembly before lockdown and we'll have a film coming up later on. So it needs 50p. And no change given either. No change given. So I have a pound on me. You have a pound. No You've change. got a pound. I have no change. Um, so more from me and Caroline Russell later. Um, everybody needs the loo and some people find it impossible to travel without them. So now let's uh, let's move to having uh, Benali on. Hello Benali, nice to see you. Um, nice to see you um, again. Um, we work together quite a lot. I'm looking forward to having you as one of my assembly colleagues soon. Um, so how are you doing today and where are you today? What, what are you up to? I'm good, thank you. Uh, I'm Dan in Highbury, um, doing quite well. My fridge has stopped working, so I have to identify why that's happened and what mystery smell emitting from the fridge is, but I'm sure it's, it's a good task for today to get fixed. Okay, so I'm, I'm all in favour of mending things, but fridges are quite difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to focus today on uh, online support for LGBTIQA+. People, and with all of us locked in lockdown in homes that may not be happy, um, these people are reliant on online support. So, uh, Benali, tell us about this. Why is this important to you? And, and what was what was your home life like? 
Um, yeah, so this is an issue I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about. Um, I grew up in a, in a household that it wasn't easy to be gay. Um, me and my dad perhaps had a, what could be generously described as a fiery relationship. Um, and for me, that meant that uh, when I was 16, 17, trying to work out who I was, who I loved and, and what life was going to be like, uh, I didn't get that acceptance at home. And it, and it was quite a hostile environment to, to try and explore and navigate. And, and it was a really uncertain time. And and um, I just think of young people in that situation having to navigate that, that, that similar kind of ter ter territory uh, in, in a lockdown uh, where, you know, everything is much more intense when the spaces that you might try and escape to or the opportunities you have to feel accepted or comfortable in your own skin, be that a specific youth club or pride, um, are suddenly curtailed. And so actually our online communities become so much more important. Um, when I was a, a young man, uh, I'm very grateful to a, an online forum called Gay Youth UK, which just gave people the opportunity to, to chat in safety. And uh, I think, you know, I remember talking a lot about Michelle Branch on that forum, but it was just an opportunity to feel uh, really comfortable in your own skin and find out who you were and, and feel supported. Um, we are in a position now where online spaces are even more developed and we, we have some great charities out there providing some great support to, to all the communities. So whether that's gendered intelligence and mermaids supporting trans youth, there's work that Stonewall does for the whole community um, and, and great services like the switchboard, uh, which provide kind of helpline and support there. We are in a really great space. So actually providing those services is, is, is really, really important. Um, and so any support that we can do to make sure those services are, are, are well kept and, and maintained is really important. And I guess the other thing to think about is what can we make happen online that would previously be in person? So again, when I was 16, 17, uh, going to a, a youth club that was for young LGBT youth um, was, was really important, and really uh, valuable for me. Uh, it meant that I could sit in a space of safety uh, talk to people that I knew uh, and, and feel comfortable in my own skin and um, suddenly that's cut off and um, so what can we do to make sure those services are, are happening online so people are still getting the support that they need um, so you know we're in this transition period um, but anything we can do to, to speed along that process of, of, of providing these services online is really important. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, as you know, I work in um, the London Assembly looking at youth services and the cuts that have been made to youth services. Uh, in this year's um, survey, we asked councils about whether they provide dedicated LGBT uh, spaces and very, very few do. We'll be, we'll be publishing that research soon. Um, in terms of online support, I mean, I just can't, I can't imagine what it would be like to be in, to be in your situation and not be able to get that online support. And you've, you've been subject to some recent attacks um, online for standing up for the provision of exit buttons on websites. Can you tell us about what they are and what happened? Yeah, so Mermaids is a is a trans uh, charity that supports uh, young children who uh, who and young adolescents who are working through kind of their gender identity, um, and f unfortunately, it's become kind of at the the centre point of a, a bit of a culture war, um, which is, is is really kind of impacting uh, you know the, the the charity and the service it provides, which is is a real frustration. Um, now it was rolling out a, a, an exit button, which is a button that you just click and it quickly takes you away from the website. To something innocuous like Wikipedia or Google. So just in case someone who is behind your shoulder um, who would not be happy to see you looking at a website like that, um, suddenly that it's redirected and, and you can browse that in safety. Um, I certainly know how important is that. I've, I've, I've literally experienced violence because I hadn't closed a browser window uh, quick enough. Um, and certainly, um, actually this is a really important uh, feature of websites for anything related to lgbt because we don't we know that so many people don't live in accepting households but it became the subject of a huge online furore lots of attacks uh, and actually it's a real shame because it's a very ordinary feature that's present on so many things it's on it's on nspcc's website it's on uh, various others so um definitely use my platform to try and say that this is something entirely ordinary um, Sadly, not everyone 
everyone lives in an accepting house and, and actually helping people navigate um, spaces online safely is so, so, so important right now, particularly when people are dealing with lockdown. And, you know, there are really important stories about people who might have been living independently and might have had bad relationships with their parents but because of the situation of having to move back home. Um, you know, I'm in the lucky position to have a, a job where I'm furloughed, but I'm being paid, um, you know, my full salary. But I know lots of people who whose work is uh, kind of evaporated and they're finding the kind of the situation of can they afford to live in London? Some people are having to move back home and suddenly they're in spaces that, that are, you know, a, a massive curb on their liberty on compared to the, the lives that they would have lived before. So online browsing and making it safe is, is important and it's not something to be sneered or, 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 or belittled really. No, I'm just massively well done for, for taking that stand and, and sticking up for the importance of that. I know, I know you've talked before about that experience that you had of, of being attacked and needing that space. Um, it's really, really important. Um, the other thing that we've, we've noticed is uh, an increase in demand for support for LGBTIQA plus uh, homelessness services. And again, when relationships break down, um, it is very important that people have these specialist services to, to find support in. They may not feel comfortable going to hostels, particularly if they're young. When we did work on hidden homelessness in the London Assembly, mm. uh, we found a big overrepresentation of LGBTIQA plus young people who were having to sofa surf. And obviously nowadays, uh, with the lockdown, that's that's not as easy. Um, I think all of these services need to be expanded, and including the online services. What's what's happening, um, and what needs to be done to support the expansion of, of more spaces and more support into into online support, uh, things like the homelessness services, for example. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, unfortunately, the maxim of not under my roof is one that really impacts uh, a lot of LGBT young people. And, um, you know, if we look at kind of data from the uh, Albert Kennedy Trust, uh, we know that young and homeless people are disproportionately from the community um, because they're looking to escape. Uh, really hostile environments and so we know that there's a there's a real need there and we know that that need hasn't always been met because of a lack of funding and uh, one of the kind of the ways government cuts uh, manifest themselves is 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 the end of specific tailored services so we see it in domestic violence services we see it in homelessness services it's much cheaper just to provide generic services than provide tailored services for communities that need it and um, the problem with that though is then suddenly these spaces aren't uh, always the most easy or welcoming places and you're finding people jumping from you know one hot frying pan to another and, and a lot of LGBT people find these hostels uh, that are generic not welcoming or not accepting and so so actually the service isn't working there and it's not providing the support that people need. So these services absolutely need supporting. Um, you know, for instance, one shocking stat that I, I, I was reminded of this year was that there isn't a specific domestic violence service in London for LGBT people. There is no tailored support in London at all. That's a horrifying uh, stat, really. And, and really, when we know that so many people come to London from the community to build their lives here, that's a real uh, uh, kind of oversight. And so while... while yeah. sorry, Sorry, did it, it close? Was it Broken Rainbows that closed down? Yeah, so I did certainly. I know there's services in Manchester, but there aren't there aren't those services in London right now, and that's a real problem. And and, and certainly there's a, a a shortfall in services with homelessness uh, as well. And so one of the things that we've been talking about is, is about Pride. We know that London Pride, unfortunately, is 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 postponed uh, this year. Um, but there is that pot of money that the mayor will be looking at to to. You know, um, support pride what can we do with that funding to make sure that services are well supported whether that's helping services transition to online or making sure the, these bespoke homelessness services actually um, have enough have enough funding and certainly that's one of the great ways that we as greens on the assembly can have a real impact it's by spotting these opportunities for where mayor, 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 the mayor's powers can make a real difference for londoners yeah, no, I'll definitely be trying to find out uh, what's going on with the funding for Pride. Some of it might be needed to fund the cancellation, but if there's any left over, I think it makes perfect sense to put it into these kinds of uh, services that need support. Um, once we get um, the Assembly running again, uh, we will get onto that and we can uh, write into him now as well. Um, so I'm going to have to 
let you go now. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, what are you going to be doing with yourself now that the election's postponed? What's, what's the plan? Uh, so there's two projects I've got. One is looking after my partner who's had some foot surgery. So I'm, I'm kind of basically a full time carer now. Um, I do a lot of fetching uh, and carrying, uh, which, uh, you know, hopefully is, is well appreciated. And if it's not, we'll be having words. Um, and the other project I've done, um, well, I've, I've done a big FOI of all the councils in the country looking at anonymous CVs and whether or not um, councils are using them to help make sure that their workforce is more diverse. And I've got the data that will hopefully show whether or not they make an impact and whether or not uh, councils are doing them enough. Uh, so I'm going to be sat with a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of comparisons and hopefully making a, a really great case for a, a really important piece of Green Party policy I'm very passionate about. Okay, I love a good spreadsheet. Well, good luck with that. Um, thank you so much for coming on, uh, Ben Ali. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Super. Um, so thank you again to Benali. He does amazing work as the co-chair of LGBTIQA plus Greens and as far as I can tell never stops working. Um, so now um, we're going to move on to uh, toilets. Uh, in the Assembly in January and February uh, we have the Mayor's budget process and this year we've managed to uncover that the Mayor had essentially lost £71 million pounds down the back of the sofa um, in a reserve fund that he sort of sat on for, for some time. So we, we challenged him uh, to come up with ways to spend that on building London's resilience now. And one of the proposals we put forward was to uh, make toilets on the tube system that do exist free and to massively increase the number of toilets. Um, so uh, we are, we before lockdown, to be absolutely clear, uh, we made a film, Hunting for Toilets on the Jubilee Line, and we're, we can show you that film now. It's me and Caroline Russell trying to find a loo. Hello, we're here at Bond Street Station and we're investigating a hidden problem in London, which is a lack of loo provision. So I've got with me Caroline Russell, my colleague from the London Assembly, and also Sophie, whose project Loo Codes is trying to do something about the problem. Tell us about it. So I'm Sophie, I'm from London Loo Codes, and we are tweeting out the keypad codes for various cafe chains across central London so that people can look them up on Twitter and we also have an open access Google document where people can go and look it up and it's all the way to find nearest tube station. Fantastic. So should we go in and have a look, see what we can find? Let's do it. Fifty P and um, no change given either. No change given. So I have a pound on me. You have a pound. You've no got change. a pound. I have no change. Um hold on. So last week I visited the new Crossrail station at Bond Street and asked where the public toilets were going to be. It's a brand new station and there's no public toilets. And in fact, the people I asked seemed to imply it would almost be a bit of a hassle to have toilets because they'd need to be cleaned and all the rest of it. Not good enough. Uh -huh. 
As you can see, we've travelled two miles across London on the tubes and the first toilet we found that is free to use is here in the Network Rail Waterloo station. These were made free last year and the people here using the toilets were very, very pleased to find a free toilet for them to use. This is something I think the Mayor of London and Transport for London should be providing on their network as a public service. It's something that Caroline and I on the London Assembly have put forward in a budget amendment last month. This month the Mayor hasn't taken up our suggestion in his final budget. We think that's wrong and I would definitely correct this if I were Mayor of London because Londoners deserve free wees. There you go, and this is not an issue Caroline and I will give up on. There will be a new budget process uh, next year, and uh, someone commented, I can't believe we're not even putting them into the new station. This needs to be corrected. Um, so that's uh, the end of the programme, and quite honestly, I need the loo now, so I'm going to have to let you go. <laughs> um, just to say, uh, before we go, uh, we have tackled some tough issues today so uh, we'll now be showing you um, how to get hold of the LGBT switchboard um, if you feel like you need any help and just to say thank you to Caroline for the, the loo hunt with me and thank you to Benali for coming on and uh, we'll see you all next week uh, where the week will all be about housing. Uh, I'm doing a seminar with the Young Greens on Thursday, look out for that and then we'll have uh, we'll talk about homelessness on the programme next week. So thank you very much and uh, goodbye.